Hello boys and girls, Brad the Guitologist here. I thought we might take a break today from fighting for truth and justice and the American way and take a look at this Gibson Falcon GA19RVT. They made these in a couple of different iterations. I did a video a while back that shows I think three different examples of Falcons and I'll put a link up here if you want to go check that out. I've serviced many Falcons over the years on this channel and usually a service involves, you know, just normal things like doing caps, cleaning everything, cleaning sockets, just testing tubes, stuff like that. A lot of times you have problems with the uh, tremolo uh, caps that have to be changed, you know, checking uh, interstage coupling capacitors, things like that that need to be checked. Sometimes you run into a uh, little problems with the foot switches that I've found before. Most of these do have foot switches still with them and that's because the foot switches were hard wired um, so they're not really prone to being lost. I can't remember if this one had it though or not. Uh, but essentially uh, what, we're, what we're looking at here with this amp is on controls is we have uh, two inputs we have a monitor output right here. Um, we have loudness control, and then we have a single tone control, uh, reverb control, which seems a bit stiff. I might have to lubricate that control a little bit. Uh, we have tremolo with depth and uh, an intensity or frequency, or excuse me, a frequency. Uh, we have an on-off switch and a one amp fuse. I'm gonna go ahead and check the one amp fuse to make sure it's correct. This is two and a half amps, so that's not a terrible value for an amp like this, but um, we could get this down to one amp. I'm going to go ahead and change that. A lot of times what you find also is uh, this little acrylic piece on the handles will sometimes be missing because those are just screwed on and they have uh, a tendency sometimes to be taken off by people and lost. Um, but if you're ever in the uh, looking for one of these handles, you can find these oftentimes on old suitcases from the same era, from the late 50s um, into the early 60s. Uh, a lot of times also what you'll see is uh, the logos broken off of these on these old Gibsons because they're kind of a bit fragile. If ever they get bumped by something, they have a tendency to crack, especially right here between the letters. So they'll kind of crack and then you'll lose half of it. Uh, this one is in perfect condition no really nice grill cloth you know it's got a little bit of corrosion and pitting right there it's not terrible i've seen a lot worse on these but uh that's very common on on these old gibsons because the upward facing chassis like this um, has a tendency to collect moisture like if you're you know if you're loading in or out of a gig or something and it's it's rainy or the dew's falling or something and it falls on this face and it just kind of sits there and then it corrodes because this is a steel chassis and not aluminum. They made some Gibson chassis that were aluminum and those held up a hell of a lot better. Uh, but this one is one of the steel chassis. Uh, they also made a couple of different um, grill cloth uh, styles with these. This one does have the foot switch that is present and accounted for. Uh, turns the tremolo on and off and the reverb as well. Got what looks like an old cord there. That might be an original cord that somebody bought when they bought the amp. That looks about the right age. Um, I've got some other cabling back here for some reason. I'm not sure why. Okay, that's, that's just a note that was sent by the, the owner. Um, so what he wants, he wants uh, uh, my standard modification and cap job. And the modification will involve um, bypassing a little couplet that's in there. I need to fix the reverb, replace the power cord with a three-prong power cord. Yeah, this indeed has the original two-prong power cord, so that would be one of the things we do. If we look down here, this has got some kind of CADL number. If you'll see this, I think... I looked this up, let me show you, show you what I'm talking about. On the back of the speaker right there, you'll see the numbers down here on the bottom. You got 137, um, that is a CTS code. Uh, so this is a CTS speaker. Five, that's 1965 actually, the 13th week. So this is, a this is kind of late, this is a late run for the crest, um, crest line amplifiers. But you'll see right here a CADL number. And it's just a big, long, like, kind of catalog number. I think the CADL is a public library. Okay, so I, 
I thought this was a little bit interesting, so I wanted to show you what I found. <laughs> Check this out. So if you type in CADL in a search engine, okay, so that lets you know it's the Capital Area District Library in uh, Ingram County, Michigan, formed in 1998, so uh, not all that old. So this AMP, if it was in this library district, wasn't there all that long ago, maybe within the last 20 five years or 24 years so man has that been that long ago 1998 is 20 well 23 years ago jeez wow that's crazy anyway so if we go to the website capital area district library <clears throat> uh we'll see they do books and more so but they also do this library of things uh that you can check out so that leads me to believe that, yeah, maybe in, indeed this AMP was once part of their library collection. I'm not sure why they would have gotten rid of it other than maybe, I don't know, they were updating it. But they do all kinds of stuff, man. You can check out sewing machines or whatever, microscopes, all kinds of crap. But they've got a whole section of musical instruments. There are a lot, a lot of libraries who are doing this. And uh, if you're interested in learning guitar or anything like that, you know, it might behoove you to check out your local library and see if they if they have something like this, you know, or if you want to do uh, something different like banjo, for instance, and you want to just see if it's for you or you want to track if you're recording at home, maybe, and you want to record a track with a cajon or something like that, you know, check your local library and see if you can check out something like this. But I thought this was interesting because check this out. They actually have theremins. You can actually check out a theremin, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Ukuleles. I mean, that's kind of nutty, right? So you see they've got electric guitar, but do they, do they let you check out the guitar with an amp? Is that how they do it? Oh, you get a backstage amp. Okay. It's only for uh, ages 18 and older, and the borrowers must sign the required Library of Things agreement. I wonder what the agreement's like. You, you, I guess that makes you responsible for lost or damaged equipment. Fees for damage or loss may be incurred up to one week after check-in. So that's if you bring it back and they find that there's damage. But gosh, if they don't find it within a week, the damage, then you're, I guess you're off the hook. Like if you break it, so you'll be you'll be guilty of larceny and prosecuted for a misdemeanor if you don't return it. Maybe because they've had such problems in the past with stuff walking off. I mean, okay, it seems like that would be a bit of a, a risk, you know. Some homeless dude comes in and and he doesn't care. He's just passing through anyway, you know. So he goes in the library and checks something out, and then goes and pawns it. And buys his drugs and then, you know, hops on a train out of town anyway, or <laughs> whatever, you know. I don't know. It just it seems a bit risky to me to do this sort of thing. But I mean, I get why they do it because it's, you know, part of their thing. But I just thought that was interesting that this, that CADL is actually a real thing and they do this library thing. So it's, it's Quite possible this amp came from this library at, at one point. And it's not necessarily that the amp was stolen either. I'm not trying to suggest that or insinuate that at all. Because libraries often will, you know, sell the, the older stuff in their collection and exchange it out for new stuff. Because they've got, they've got a massive budget, like of $10 million for this just this one county. And I guess that's an annual budget, right? Of $10 Ten and a half million dollars. They have a staff of 251 people. They don't even sell anything. You know what I mean? It's like, it's nuts to me. I mean, libraries are cool and all, but it's, uh, that's a lot of money that's just going to things that, I mean, I have gotten stuff out of library, um, uh, rummage sales and stuff like that. You know, they'll hold every now and then where they'll turn over the books and, uh, get rid of the old stuff that they're selling and you pick up books like 90% of the books is, it looks like it's never even been read you know I mean the spine is still like crispy on a lot of this stuff and I, you know I mean to be fair I think maybe they get rid of the stuff that isn't used as much anyway 
But isn't that the point of a library? It's like you you have a collection that the the stuff needs to be there and stay there in case somebody needs it. Instead, you know, they have a, this annual budget that just keeps turning over, and if they don't use it, the budget oftentimes will go down. It's kind of like the roads, you know what I mean? And everybody's like, well, if we didn't, ha we wouldn't have roads, or we wouldn't have libraries, or, you know, all this kind of stuff. If you didn't have socialism, you should be thinking you're lucky stars we have this form of socialism. Well, no, not necessarily, because if you, if you look at what libraries actually, what's the cost-benefit analysis that you do on libraries, especially now that most everyone has you know, access to the internet and stuff anyway, and anything you want to learn is pretty much, you know, online. All of the the older books that are, you know, out of copyright anyway, you can usually find a PDF on it somewhere. So I don't know, man. It just, it seems less and less worth it to me. But I, anyway, we'll, we'll set aside my critique of the library, public library system, <laughs> maybe for another day. But I just thought it was interesting that, that these guys actually have a library of things, and this could have very well uh, come from there, so... Okay, uh, we'll see here the power transformer. This has a 1965 date code on it. Uh, that's an original transformer. That's 65. This one I can't see on that. That is for the reverb. This is output. This is power transformer. All three are original. Everything lo actually looks really good back here. Um, the tubes... That's a GE, these are RCA, so we've got some good old tubes in here. Uh, this one looks like it is, that's an old RCA. So we've got some, we've got all the right stuff. We've got good tubes in this. Uh, these should be six EU7s up front, I think, in this amp. I believe that's what they came with. Yeah, six, so we've got six EU7, six EU7, a six C4, which is like uh, one triode half of a 12AX7. Uh, then you've got another 6 EU7. One of these will be for um, the tremolo, one of them will be for driving reverb, and then you, you'll have, of course, for your channels. Um, then this is, these are the output. You got two 6V6s and then a 5Y3 rectifier. Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and uh, open this thing up. We'll pull the chassis and get started. This is gonna be fairly routine, but if you haven't seen one of these before, or you don't know what the Gibson Falcon amps are all about, um, you're in for a real treat because these are one of the hidden treasures of the 1960s. I've never run across a Gibson Falcon that wasn't well worth my time invested uh, because these are killer, killer amps. Okay, so here we are with this chassis out on the bench. We can see we have an empty retainer over here where one of the original capacitors used to be probably the one that, I think the one that carried these two uh, in a single sleeve uh, so these have been replaced and you can see where they were cut and kind of just I don't know just messy with the tape over here this one has been replaced as well this is a Sprague uh, I'm not sure what year these Sprague's are from I'll have to you know it's kind of hard to tell I think these might be old like 80s ish kind of old but I'm not sure on the age of these Sprague Adams. These are good caps, and they don't look like they have been under any stress. What I might do here uh, is test them and make sure that they're in working order. And th this one over here, too, I'll make sure it's in working order and clean some of this up. You can see here the way it was spliced. They just basically chopped this th these leads off and then spliced them really crappily. So I'll clean that up. I'm going to clean these up. We've got the death capacitor over here. Uh, this one we will probably replace. Any of these really old sprays from like the 60s um, and back into the 50s, this was probably actually new old stock at the time that it was put in this amp. This Black Beauty right here is probably from the 50s. And they, I would imagine Gibson had a whole bunch of these left over from the late 50s that they were using all through uh, into the 60s in their amps. And this is an unusual value too. That's a 0.22. So that would have been one that if they did have that in stock, they, they wouldn't have been able to use that for really much of anything else except for maybe in that one position right there. So yeah, clean it. We'll clean this stuff up. I'll replace this, uh, replace this little bypass cap right here on the output. Um, that's an original spray. You can see just the, the way that you know, this was these were spliced in. It's just really nasty with the tape and all that. So we'll get we'll fit, we'll clean all that up. This is really better 
better put together than a lot of uh, Gibsons that you see from uh, right after this period. Right after this period, they kind of went they went to a really sloppy way of doing things. It was just it was all laid out on a board, but it wasn't laid out really in any logical order. Everything was just kind of slapdash on the board. It wasn't linear like this, you know, laid out straight across. So it's a lot messier in some later Gibson amps. We do have a couple of more sprays down here. Some some old bypass caps. There's one and there's one back in there. We've got these brown turd capacitors. Um, you know, those have been hit and miss in my experience. We may just go ahead and shotgun those out of there uh, just on principle because I have not had the greatest of luck with those. This orange drop right here is probably okay. These these absorb moisture, I think, less so than these brown caps. I've just had some brown caps like this that weren't great. These are only 400 volt rated as well, so I can probably I can do better than that on the caps. And here is our little uh, couplet right here, this little orange thing, that's a Sprague. These things are basically a tone shaping network. It's kind of an all-in-one little thing, and uh, they were, really made to take out certain frequencies and accentuate other frequencies in these amps. And the reason for that is they were trying to keep the amp as clean as possible all the way up the dial with Gibson guitars. That much seems pretty uh, apparent to me. Because with a Gibson humbucker, if you don't extract certain frequencies and shape the tone in an amplifier, you're going to really have a tendency to overdrive, especially if you crank an amp. Um, this thing still will overdrive with humbuckers if you crank it all the way and you hit the strings pretty hard. But it, this is kind of doing the job of taking out all that gain. So you're really losing a lot of gain by having one of these in here too. And it just, it's one of those things that's a preference thing. Um, I have showed the difference in many times in the past. I'll put a video up here if you want to see, or, or maybe a link to some other Gibson amplifiers where you can See where I've done this before and showed, you know, kind of A and B what they sound like. I'm not going to do that in this. I'm basically going to shotgun all this. We will do a demo at the end of this, and I'll show you how good these amps can sound. But, yeah, let's go ahead and, and uh, do those things. We'll do some cleaning as well. We'll clean all the sockets, clean all of the pots, jacks, all that good stuff. And, yeah, just pretty standard service here. All right, first thing I want to do, I want to clean up this stuff. These are 10 microfarads at 450 volts. I'm thinking there's yeah there's definitely a better way to do this other than this crap hanging it hanging it out in the air like this is pretty silly. I mean there's going to be hundreds of volts right here and look how close it is to everything. I mean it's just flopping. So not good. Um, it would be nice to have a couple if these well let's first let's see if these work and then we'll just kind of go from there. We'll see what what they measure at. I mean, I'm not going to be able to measure at high voltage, but like I said, these have been replaced. Most of the sprays that, that are out now are blue, and I, I don't know the date. I don't know how to read the date codes on these, so I don't know exact date on it. But uh, I do know that these are, you know, these aren't new, but they're not original either to the amp. Okay, so the first one is testing at uh, 24 microfarad with pretty high ESR. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be replacing these, I, I can tell. For a second there, I thought we might not have to replace these, but I'm changing my mind now. Because I do know that these are fairly old. Yeah, 24 microfarad on that one, too. I mean, that one's... Yeah, that one's lossy with a. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't like the ESR being like that. Yeah, we're gonna pull those out of there and do something different. Okay, so we've uh, got this thing mostly rewired, and I'll just give you a quick pass and show you what all's been done. You can see I've done all of the uh, power capacitors. There, I've replaced all of the bypass caps as well. You'll see some of those on the board. I've replaced uh, <clears throat> caps in the the trim which are in there, those those brown turds. Uh, these right here I've actually got two in parallel. These are 105 degrees Celsius capacitors and I have a whole bunch of these that were given to me. 
and I want to use those up. So I've got two in parallel to make up 10 microfarad. Um, but those are actually better than what I normally put in amps as standard anyway. So the only thing really to do now is to replace this couplet. And I wanted to show you essentially what we're going to do here. Here's the manual, the original manual for the GA19 RVT Falcon. Um, and I'll just flip through here real quick. You can see kind of what this is all about. You can get, and I've, I've downloaded this and printed this printed this out. This actually, I didn't download it. It came from a book that I own about Gibson amplifiers, and I thought I would just print it out and include it with this for the customer. But the thing is, and this is kind of neat, it's got some example settings for reverb, different things, instruments, yada, yada, yada. It's got a lot of kind of documentation here. Operation of a microphone talks about you know, you can use this as a microphone amplifier, which is what I think they were doing at this library that this thing probably belonged to um, at one time. I'm pretty certain they were using this as a, like some little public address thing for, a, maybe they had it plugged into a lectern or something, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it has that library number on there so I think that's what it was originally from but anyway okay so here is the schematic that came with uh, this manual uh, that's in the Gibson uh, master service manual this one though <coughs> has a slightly different uh, tube complement this has a 6 EU7 for V1 and a 7199 tube for V2 and the V2 tube is uh, part of the reverb you can see here um, the amplification coming out of the reverb tank is uh, the 7199, or is, one, is the pentode half of the 7199. Then you've got a triode half as well. If you have one of these that has the 7199 in it and you can't find good 7199s anymore, if they're getting increasingly hard to find, what you might do is look at like uh, the 6GH8 tube or the uh, six I think it's a six u8 some of those uh, pinto triode uh, tubes that came standard in a lot of televisions from back in the day you might be able to re to rewire the socket and replace with that if you want to uh, but this one actually has a six eu7 in this position um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure when they started doing that. It might have been on some later ones. I think they were trying to use up some 7199 tubes that they had in stock from uh, previous designs. You know, they had a lot of 50s amps that had used the 7199. And uh, I think they were trying to use those up. And then when they used up that stock, they didn't want to continue using it. So what they did instead was they just moved to the 6EU7 uh, for, that, for that second position. And then it's got a... 6C4 in the V3 position. So uh, this is, I mean, just a much, it's a little bit more efficient use of the space that, you know, or the, I guess what I'm trying to say, uh, of the parts and components that they could design with. This is a, an Epiphone EA25 RVT, which is basically the equivalent of the Falcon. This one's kind of faded, and I had to fill in some areas here with some pin but this one also has the couplet listed right here and it is not listed on this schematic as you can see there's just a 500 picofarad coupling capacitor coming out of that and uh or well no wait i guess it'd be between the first two stages yeah excuse me so they've got a 0.02 capacitor right there between those first two stages um and that is probably what I'm going to put there as a 0.02 capacitor um, because you can see the difference. Without the couplet, they have this 0.02, and then with the couplet, they have they have this 0 0.001 right here going into the couplet also, and then out of that into uh, the controls. So the couplet right he right here, I'm just going to clip it out. If we follow the wire that's coming from the couplet back over here, up on the board, that's where that little, uh, was it, what I say it was, a point zero zero one is located. And we're going to remove this capacitor and replace that with like a point, probably either a point oh two uh, or a point oh five, one of the two. Um, 
I've done some experiments in the past with that, and I think I I think I settle on well, but e either one is is good, but it just depends on what speaker I think you have in the amp. With some speak stock speakers, the .02 sounds best, and with some uh, of the other stock speakers, the .05 sounds best. Now this one is the CTS speaker, which is a little bit of a beefier speaker than some of the ones that came stock in this. So I'm thinking I might go with a .05, but we'll just kind of have to see. But anyway, that's the plan right now. So I'm going to uh, just I'm going to clip this couplet out of here. So this is basically the only modding that I will do on this amp. I'm not going to do a whole lot of mods. It's a very simple mod. You just basically remove this couplet and you replace a capacitor over here uh, instead of this thing. And that I can just clip. So just clip this. Leave leave the green wire because there's green wires that are going from uh, this leg right here, or excuse me, this leg right here rather, uh, oh, jumping over to the uh, to the wiper of this pot, and then it's also jumping over here to the leg of this pot as well. So those are all strung together. So it really doesn't matter which one you hook on to. You, I could hook on to this one over here and use less wire, which is probably what I'll do. I'll hook it right directly to there. But we're just going to get rid of that. And we'll just use what little wire we need. So probably just about that much. So like I said, we're just going to run this directly. And actually, I'm going to try to pass this down here as close to the chassis as possible because, I don't know, the closer I get to the chassis, the less chance there is of noise being introduced through that wire into the uh, next stage. So we'll just pass that down here kind of out of the way. So there, that actually is a .001. And any little capacitors or components like this that I that I feel like are probably useful in something else, I'll save that. Um, the couplet is pretty useless. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who ever wants to put one of these back in an amplifier, but there it is. Uh, here are the here are the casualties, or most of them anyway. Here's most of the stuff I've ripped out of there. So just a lot of uh, capacitors that are just old and ready to go. Okay, so a quick correction from the last clip. Um, I said I think the I think I said the EA25 RVT was the same, but I, I misread that. It's actually the EA28 RVT, uh, which is the Epiphone version of the Falcon, and that's also known as the Pathfinder. So that's the that's the schematic for the Epiphone uh, Pathfinder, which is the same as the, the Falcon that we see here, which uh, has the 6C4 and the 6EU7 instead of the 7199. Also, what is interesting is I found that the Maestro, uh, which were also made by Gibson, uh, is a different line, and they were kind of more marketed towards like uh, high school bands and things like that. Um, I guess is the best way I could sort of describe it, but at any rate. Um, so the Maestro version is model M-216RVT, and I think the Maestro version is much more rare than the Falcon. Well, I know it is for a fact. I've never seen a Maestro version. I think I may have seen a Pathfinder at one point, um, but the, the Falcons, I believe, are by far the most common. But what I found was interesting in the uh, instruction manual for the Maestro version is that they give you um, they give you this really kind of nifty <laughs> operational not not that anyone would really need this anyway or most people wouldn't really need this but I, it's kind of cool it, operational instructions uh, 
for use of this reverberation amplifier in conjunction with a regular amplifier. So what they are suggesting that you do here is uh, basically plug your instrument, plug your guitar into the first input of the of the Falcon or the Maestro, um, and then come out of the second jack and then go to a different amplifier and you can spread them apart obviously and get a really wide kind of cool uh, sound that way so that that's what they say here is the use of this reverberation amplifier with a regular amplifier will add a spacious liveliness to the instrument reproduction that is far beyond the possibilities of a single amplifier reverberation listed below are simple instructions for this type of operation Plug the AC cord of the reverb amplifier into a convenient outlet. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> For normal signal amplification in the regular amplifier, insert one plug of a shielded jumper cord into jack number two of the reverberation amplifier. Plug the other end of this jumper into the input jack normally used in the regular amplifier. For reverberation and or normal signal with or without tremolo amplification in the regular amplifier, move the plug from jack number two to the monitor jack on the reverberation amplifier. Now what? Oh, okay, so, okay, I get what they're saying. So there are a couple different ways you could do this. Uh, you could come out of the uh, second input and go to a second amp, right? Or you could come out of the monitor output and then just go into the input of your second amp. And that's going to give you the preamp section of uh, of this amplifier, probably the first stage or two. I, for, I forget where the monitor uh, comes off of on this. Let's see where the monitor comes out. Okay, so actually, no, I'm, I'm mistaken there. The monitor is actually on the output it's it's like an it's like an attenuated output. You can see here it's got some. Um, it's on the output, but it's it's attenuated to to four hundred seventy ohms. So it would be safe to plug that into the input of a of another amp. We could do the same thing and move that monitor output and just uh, to like pre phase inverter. So we could change that if we wanted to. You won't have trim though. Your tremolo is adjusting the output bias of the tubes, so you wouldn't get tremolo unless you had your monitor uh, on the output like they have it here. So another thing I find interesting is that the Gibson Falcon instructions make no mention whatsoever of the monitor output. They don't tell you how to use it, what's coming off of, or how, or anything about it. If you actually were un unsure what the monitor did, you would still have no idea even after reading the instruction manual for this. Whereas on the Maestro, you know, they at least include that information. Okay, so I decided to install a 0 0.02 capacitor in between the first two stages there. And the reason I did that is because that was what was called for in the, uh, the other Falcon schematic. But I made an executive decision here also, and I decided to use a ceramic capacitor uh, which I've done in a lot of uh, a lot of different experiments and um, you know modifications for other amps in the past but I've never tried it on a Falcon so we're gonna see what it sounds like with a ceramic capacitor between those first two stages of a Falcon and I you know the reason I do that is because um, ceramic capacitors they they have a certain sound to them you know there there is a microphonics that comes with a ceramic capacitor and it just adds a an element of sparkle on top of the notes and it's there's a squishiness to it and a reactive element to it that you just don't get um, with any kind of poly style cap. So we're gonna try this and see how it turns out. And I think if it's anything like the successes I've had in the past, this should be really, really cool. So uh, yeah, stay tuned, we're gonna demo this thing now. So I've got this thing uh, fired up. I've got it dialed most of the way up. The voltages and everything look pretty good. Uh, I've got some got some noise though. Well, that output tube was kind of noisy.
The reverb doesn't seem as washy as it should. And it's all the way up, so something's something's definitely up with that. The trim works fine. Obviously, you can hear that. There's a hint of reverb, but it's not anything like it should be. So I'm going to pull the tank. I'm going to see what's going on. You can actually... You can hit the reverb, so I think what the, what reverb I am hearing is um, is reverb that's being induced on the on the output of the reverb circuit, and not not necessarily uh, coming into the reverb tank via the the uh, signal path. So I'm gonna pull the tank here, and we'll see what's going on with that. I'm hoping it's just a matter of a bad connection or bad ground or something like that. So we're gonna clean the connections on the tank and if that doesn't solve it we'll open the amp back up and see what's going on but I'm thinking that it's probably a probably a connection issue that you nine times out of ten that's what it ends up being with the uh, reverb so you can hear there already Oh yeah, and I forgot about this, the, the ubiquitous gunk inside of the reverb tank bag. Oh, that's always fun. It's all, it's usually a bunch of dust. Okay, 1965, 12th week on that tank. See what's going on with this input. Okay, obviously we're getting good signal out of the tank. And we'll spray these and see if that helps it. Okay, so obviously the switch works. It's always fun.
definitely need to clean that. No, I think it might just be a weak tube. Um, and also, I want to I want to turn it off for a bit. I pull the output tubes. I pull all the tubes and clean all the sockets. I, I still need to do that anyway. But um, I don't know. I think it might be a weak tube, and uh, I think it's going to be a weak input. So that's going to mean. That's gonna mean we need a new 6C4. Uh, Cause the 6C4 is what drives the reverb unit. So I think it's either a weak or dead uh, 6C4 tube. So we're gonna test that. We'll, we'll, I'll try to dig up another one. I know I have a bunch of those around. So we'll, uh, we'll check that and uh, also clean some sockets and see where that gets us. Okay, so I'm doing some tests here on the amp. I took the 6C4 tube out, which is the driver tube for the reverb. Uh, I tested it on my tester. It tested really, really good, actually. It was very strong. Um, I tested a couple other 6C4s that I had in my stash, and the one that was in already in the amp was the strongest one of the bunch. So I put the uh, tube back in it. Let's see, this is the lead for the input of the uh, reverb tank. So I'm taking a signal off of this and sending it to my little bench amplifier up there. And uh, I've got the volume down on this amp and I've got the volume up on my little bench amp up here. And I can, I can control, I can control how much signal is, go, is going to my bench amp with the reverb control on this amp. And there's quite a quite a lot of gain there on tap. So the 6C4 is definitely working. It is pushing signal out of this. It does appear, I don't know. I don't know if that's, I think that might just be the connection uh, on these gator clips that I've got here. We'll keep that in mind that maybe it's not, but I think it's the gator clips. Yeah, it's, I think it's definitely the Gator Clips. Check the pickups at both ends of the reverb tank, and they are both continuous and working. So it's not the tank, it's not the tube, it's not the output, and we're definitely getting something back into this amp through, with, through the return. So that's good. Um, I don't know what else it could be. I'm gonna test it out again. Maybe, maybe it's just fixed itself now. I, I don't know. It could be that uh, could be just taking taking the tube out in and out of the socket a few times is has uh, clean. I don't know, cleaned the lead or something. I'm, we'll see. I mean, there's definitely there's reverb there for sure there's none and there's full reverb okay so I know I said uh, that we were ready for a demo on this thing but I decided to uh, make a couple more changes the reverb was really weak I'm not sure what's going on with this I'm not sure if the tank uh, for is maybe mismatched or maybe it was um manufactured with some weird specs that weren't intended for this i, I don't know but it, it everything in the reverb section checked out and uh, according to you know what's on the schematic um what's on this epiphone pathfinder schematic is pretty close to the reverb that we have in the amp and all the values in the reverb section were pretty much all correct. I checked the reverb tank. The reverb tank was continuous on both ends. Everything was fine there. The um, 
the impedance of, of uh, both of the inducers um, was the same, so it really doesn't matter which way you um, you installed the tank. So anyway, that was there. The voltage uh, was correct on the transformer, so I assume the transformer is fine. Usually with transformers, they're either you know they either work or they don't. Very rarely will you find a shorted, you know, shorted turns transformer on something like a reverb transformer. It just doesn't happen a lot. So I don't think it has anything to do with that either. It was just just really weak for some reason. Um, tested all the resistors in this network, and all those seem to be fine. They're kind of within tolerance, more or less. I mean, for an amp of this age, they're pretty, they're close enough. That shouldn't have been that weak. Um, I did notice that this V2. Uh, triode right here has a 470 ohm resistor here before the 2.2k bias resistor so what that is it's it's this resistor right here there's a resistor right down here it's this one so it's actually bridging from the socket down to the board this 470k so what i did was i just bypassed that with a jumper wire so i've got gotten rid of that so now we can basically delete the 470 and it's just a 2.2K and that is more in keeping with the M216 schematic, which is that uh, Maestro schematic, which just has a 2.2K bias resistor with a 20 microfarad bias, uh, bypass capacitor. Um, pretty much everything else was the same on this side between the two schematics. Uh, so all of all of this stuff is otherwise pretty much the same except for that 470. So I deleted the 470. Um, that did beef it up just a little bit. Uh, also went ahead and right here around this 1K, I bypassed that with a 10 um, microfarad bypass capacitor. And I upped the value of this 470 to a 1 meg. And that helped uh, quite a lot, I think. You know, I mean, it just, it's still not, it's still not really... Um, I don't know. It's still not really swampy reverb like or springy reverb uh, like some of these that I've had. I don't know. It just seems like maybe this one is slightly on the weak side, and it's just, that's just the way it's going to be. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's down to the tank. It could be. It could be down to that tank. Just wasn't uh, manufactured with the with the right uh, impedance or something. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe somebody changed the tank at some point. Um, I did notice that somebody had been in there and had the tank open at some point because there was some tape on there that was it was obviously not factory tape. So I had to remove that to get in to get in there and uh, replace the, replace the tape with something else. But here I'll show you what I mean. This this so so this tape. This stuff right here, obviously, that's not factory from the 1960s. That's some modern Scotch tape, and they had that, they had that on there, uh, holding the tank closed, and you know that just basically told me somebody, somebody had been in there before. I don't know if they changed that tank. It looks like a correct tank. It has the correct date code. It's like 1965, twelfth week or something like that. So I believe it's the original tank to this amp. It was just kind of just a weak reverb for some reason. I tested. Um, all three of uh, V1, V2, V3, because interestingly enough, um, this amp uses V1, V2, and V3 all in the reverb circuit. So all three of those tubes have to be working in order for the reverb to fully work. Um, uh, these were very strong. This tube is, V2 is extremely strong. It, it was pegging the meter. Uh, V1 is a little on the weak side on one of the halves, but it wasn't. It, it's definitely a workable tube, um, and also, uh, like I mentioned before, V3 was just fine. That 6C4, so everything is working to spec. It's just uh, I don't know. The, you can ju judge for yourself. The reverb, I'm not sure if it's um, what I would call great in the amp compared to some of the ones, some of the Falcons that I've had. The reverb was just really on par with. Um, fenders of the same era and it was just you know really nice reverb for whatever reason this one just isn't quite as impressive as some of the other ones that I've seen so I don't know but everything is up to spec so we're gonna 
Test it out now and tell me what you think.